Man approaches God most nearly when he is in one sense least like God. For what can be more unlike than fullness and need, sovereignty and humility, righteousness and penitence? Welcome to Pines with Jack, Season 5, Episode 1. The Four Loves, Chapter 1. Introduction, Part 1. Good morning, everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast where three friends, Andrew, David, and Matt, break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season, we're talking about love, slowly working our way through The Four Loves by C.S. Lewis, the book he writes about affection, friendship, romance, and charity. And welcome to season five, everyone. What have you been up to since we last recorded? (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Well, I've been keeping busy. Uh, about a halfway through the my penultimate semester in seminary, and in addition to my work there, also still working on my doctorate, uh, and also one of my classes in seminary involves writing three different articles or chapters. Uh, I I don't know why I thought this would be an easier semester, uh, <laughs> but uh, here we are. I was also recently asked back on the Upstream podcast with Shane um, Shane Morris. They're doing a marvelous series on abolition of man, and Michael Ward has been involved with that. And I think one of the Colson Center book clubs is doing uh, a study on that. So uh, that's been fun. And then I've got to brag on my wife. She finished writing another book, and she just got her doctorate in contextual ministry from Northwind Seminary. So she has completed her project on uh, the prayer labyrinth and the works of Henry Nowen. And now I have to call her Dr. Ditchfield, which actually kind of <laughs> makes me very happy. <laughs> what about you, Matt? Can we do a happy hour with her sometime? Because I do think Lewis still takes the crown, but Henry Nowen is a very, very close second for me. And I remember her and I bonded just briefly because we couldn't go on a tangent when we were recording The Silver Chair. But mm-hmm. I would love for us to do a little quote unquote happy hour session Absolutely. with her and talk about just Henry Nowen. And yeah, that would be awesome. Sure. Well, she doesn't drink. She's allergic allergic to alcohol, so I'll drink for her, and that's a that's a happy happy combination. <laughs> that's what I call gift love, right there. Yes, yes. Well, I'm a giver. I don't like to talk about it much, <laughs> or all the time. <laughs> what about you, Matt? What's going on with you since we started last recorded? Yeah, lots. I guess. Um, I'm I'm starting right now. Actually, it's interesting as we record this. This season, or at least for the next month or two, I feel like the only time I'm going to be having a little bit of scotch is on this episode. I'm doing this big, it's not really an Exodus 90, but it's practically an Exodus 90. It's just a self-imposed recognition that there's still habits that linger from the pandemic that need to go. And so I have locked down out of my life, no TV, no media of any sort. I've deleted the podcast apps from my phone. I can't listen to podcasts anymore. Um, I'm essentially allowing myself... Like audiobook is the closest form of like a dopamine type thing because I found myself when I'm going to work, I couldn't even pray anymore on my way to work. I was like addicted to needing some sort of podcast going. Mm-hmm. It was like getting bad. Mm-hmm. So I was like, all right, this stuff is all gone. Um, so hopefully that means where I'm coming full circle with this is David, when you ask me if I finish some books, since that's about all I can do in my life <laughs> in the evenings, I will have read some books. And I have actually powered through like three or four books. Not the one that I know you want to <laughs> ask me if I finished, but I've finished a bunch of other ones. <laughs> and I just read Reinventing Your Life. Phenomenal, somewhat like uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy type book. I don't I'm not trying to endorse that type of thing, but some therapists that wrote this really good book on 11 Life Traps, a Catholic friend had recommended it to me. Phenomenal. And I uh, had dinner with a former guest. I was in New York for a week. It was fantastic. Father Mark Mary, if you guys remember Habits of Holiness, Mm -hmm. definitely go check out that book. I'll re-endorse that here. That was lovely. They are just as genuine. The the entire brothers are because everyone was there, Father Angelus, Father Innocence, and they are just so great in person. Mm -hmm. And then I am a godfather twice over. So my own (laughs) niece... And uh, my college roommate has asked me to be a godfather to his little daughter. So two girls are uh, unfortunately stuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to send you a post that I wrote called uh, How to Be a Rockstar Godparent. Mm. Oh, I totally need that. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of godparents and baptisms, that's pretty much been my life recently. Mm. Uh, because since the last episode from last season, my son has been born. 
His name is Alexander Charbel Bates. And a couple of weeks ago, we drove to the Byzantine parish in Minneapolis, and he received all of his sacraments of initiation. So he was baptized, he was chrismated, confirmed, and he received his first Holy Communion. Oh, fantastic. Mm. Congratulations. Praise to Jesus on that one. Thank you. Naturally, Marie and I are getting less sleep than we would like, uh, but we're mostly functioning on tea and coffee. You know that uh, PG Tips makes a double caffeinated tea. So I only have to put in two extra bags? (laughs) No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, It'll be mainlining this stuff. Are you changing diapers, David? Oh, many. Uh, He typically wakes us up anything between two and four times a night. Mm. It's been a little Mm. bit more regular uh, towards the four than the two recently, but that's that's, that's okay. I love him. Well, and we chatted <laughs> earlier. It. It's uh, you're having a different autumn than you had last year in San Diego, aren't you? And this is true. We are now firmly established in Wisconsin, and I've seen leaves actually. Well, I've seen trees with leaves, and I've seen the <laughs> leaves on those trees change color. So uh, I'm actually at the moment shopping for a snowblower, which I'm going to need <laughs> in about a month. Well, you can crowdsource that. You know, maybe our maybe our listeners can help you out. Okay, yeah. Anyone that's got a cheap snowblower going uh, that is also going to save me lots of time because we have a long drive, uh, shoot me an email. That's fantastic. Actually, today before uh, before my library shift here at the seminary, um, I roasted some root veg. And so as soon as we finish up here, I'm going to make Martha Stewart's recipe for butternut squash, parsnip, leek, and uh, Granny Smith apple soup. So, y'all come on over. I've got a nice hot bowl of soup for you. (laughs) It sounds delicious, but uh, I think we'll have to have a good drink with that. So, Matt, would you mind telling the listeners what we're drinking today? Well, I am going to – I'll give you a little backstory, but I don't know a lot about it. Um, And I'm actually drinking something different. Unfortunately, they only had two. But when I was in Oxford, listeners, as you guys know, I came across a purely whiskey scotch dedicated shop. What that meant was they had a lot of samplers. And in the United States, it is really hard to get little sampler scotches. And when we do these tastings, it's not like we can go buy a bunch of full bottles of scotches and taste a different one every single week because that would be too pricey. So I spoiled the gentleman and found 10 or 15 different samplers. I don't really know exactly how many it was and sent them each some of them. And this one was the nicest one. It was a Tomatool 25. I know nothing about it. I just saw his 25-year age and figured it's not often you get one of those. And so they're doing that, and I am going to be drinking Macallan 18. Matt, as the young one, doesn't want to hang out with anything too old, which is why (laughs) Andrew and I are on separate locations. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to get a scotch that's just half as old as me. That's all I'm asking. (laughs) (laughs) Well, together we're going to be toasting a gold-level supporter, Victoria Smith. So if you'll please raise your glass. Victoria, as we begin this season, we pray that you too will have many great new beginnings throughout your life, and like this 25-year-old whiskey, may they just get better with age. Cheers. 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 That was a great toast, David. Thank you very much. I figured if you're going to buy me a 25-year-old scotch, it's got to be a good toast. Oh... Listeners, we're going to try to not spend as much time doing tasting stuff, but this one, because it's 25 year age, take your time, guys, to just let that settle in. Mm. <laughs> Tastes lots of toffee. We did a survey recently of our listeners, and we read every single comment, and we thank you for your feedback, and we're trying to take some of that to heart. And so we want to make Pints with Jack uh, more user friendly. And so we uh, have taken notes on all that you've said, and we will be adjusting things accordingly. I hope that. Uh, that pleases you. Where is it on the spectrum of of like a Lagavulin versus Macallan? Is it is it more the smooth? Yeah, it's more the it more smooth Lagavulin or the uh, the uh, Macallan. It's not not. I don't taste any peat. Do you? No, it's not very peaty, not very smoky, but just very warm is how I would yeah. describe it. There's a quite a Ooh. quite a toffee taste in the mouth, and then as it's going down, maybe it's just because I'm looking at a cold wisconsin landscape i just feel warm inside as the whiskey descends <laughs> yeah it's kind of a slow warm it's it's kind of long after the swallow and a little bit oily feel in the mouth and yeah um uh, i think toffee is toffee is good so now, i've got no a horse in this race and i won't be offended is it 
is it worth the 25? I mean, you think of a 25 year age scotch and you're like, all right, I don't actually know what a regular bottle of this costs, but they weren't cheap single <laughs> tasting mm-hmm. sessions. <laughs> and so is it, is it like, is it good? I would definitely say it's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it worth whatever markup it is because it's this old? I'm not sure. I might have looked in the tasting notes book and saw the 21 and the 21 was lower rated than Macallan 12. So I was kind of like, this might just not be a great scotch. I think that um, when it comes to something that you like, especially you know, with a scotch, you stick with a brand that you enjoy and then, you know, it varies so widely, but I think that I would invest in an older Lagavulin or certainly in an old Cull Ela. To be 25 just for the sake of 25, um, I think if you were a Tom and Town fan, you'd really notice the difference. When I've had like a uh, Steve Beebe, our former guest, had me to his house once and he had an 18 of something and a 21 of something else. And you could really taste the difference. There's an effervescence to this. You know, there's no bite, you know, it um, uh, to it. So. Yeah, I think that I'd probably invest in an older one when it was a, a favorite scotch. But this is uh, a delightful dram. And cheers to you too, Matt, <laughs> for providing for us. So I think our summary is old but serviceable. And speaking of old but serviceable, Andrew, <laughs> our listeners hopefully know that we're doing the Four Loves this season. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the background to it? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. <laughs> I was changing the tennis balls on my walker. <laughs> Do you see how smooth that transition was and insulting at the same time? It was it was quite perfect. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. You're the humblest guy you know. Ask anybody, you've told them all. Um, <laughs> this, uh, I'm so grateful that we're doing this book. As I mentioned last, uh, last season, The Four Loves is the most important book uh, shaping me, forming me as a man, um, as a person, as an adult. Because it really helped me to understand the boundaries of love. And so often my expectations of one love or another um, were skewed because I didn't understand the nature of love. And Lewis does, I think, a marvelous job at kind of helping us with that. Um, He describes four loves, and we'll be getting deeply into them. But um, friendship love, family or national love, affection romantic love, and of course, divine love. And sometimes I realized in my 20s before I read this book, some of my expectations of a love were skewed because when I thought it was one thing, it was another. Um, So uh, affection is the kind of thing that you have for your graduating class. Um, But it's very few maybe of your high school uh, chums that are still friends because, uh, or that are that you're still in touch with, because they're maybe not necessarily friends. So um, this was a very helpful look. My contention is that uh, this book is, in some ways, the prose version of Till We Have Faces. It's published in 1960, and actually, uh, I like noting that the copyright holder in the first edition is Helen Joy Lewis. Um, so, uh, when I actually asked Doug Gresham about this in the kilns in 2013, I said, you know, why, why your mother, um, as the copyright holder, as if she was the author. And he said, oh, I think that it had something to do with, um, maybe just making sure that we had, that we were, that we boys were provided for so that she had the royalties and the rights, um, that, that went to him. In fact, I just had an email from him recently uh, where I asked about whether or not uh, I'm probably being too glib, um, but I I wonder if maybe Joy Davidman is the author of The Four Loves in C.S. Lewis. Certainly, she became his friend. She was his his wife, so Eros, romantic love. Um, She offered him a family and became his family. And then, of course, Lewis uh, showed a lot of divine love for her. He was a little unsure about that assertion, but uh, I think that there's a lot about what's going on in in Till We Have Faces, where he's trying to express what he thinks about in The Four Loves. It originally began in 1958. The unlikely named uh, woman, I think Caroline Rakestraw, asked Lewis to to give four talks on the radio about love. In part, it's uh, a response to Anders Nygren about Eros and Agape. 
Um, that's how Lewis pronounced it, by the way. We usually here in this country say agape, but um, agape is how he pronounced it. So Lewis gave four radio talks about each of the four loves in 1958. Kind of got some uh, criticism about those talks um, that he did for the Episcopal Radio and Television Foundation. Uh, got some criticism for being a little bit too frank about sex. Um, Mrs. Rakestraw asked him to give these recordings. And at one point, I think she asked him to sit there and breathe so that our listeners could take in your essence. Um, <laughs> so Lewis was not all that impressed by such an approach. The Board of Bishops kind of pulled the plug on the talks, but the talks are still available. In fact, um, David and I were chatting about this um, earlier. There is no audiobook of The Four Loves. The only audio that we have is Lewis recording these four talks in 1958. And there are some differences to them. And so I think that of it as a radio draft, and then he revised that radio draft uh, and published it uh, as The Four Loves in 1960. He dedicated it to Chad Walsh. I thought that it that was um, particularly significant because it was Chad Walsh who encouraged Joy Davidman first to reach out to Lewis and to write him a letter. And so uh, I think that I find Joy Davidman just all over this book. And as I said, I think it's the prose version of what Lewis was trying to say in The Four Loves and everybody missed. But that's no news to our listeners, especially those who have uh, waited through season three. At a minimum, I'd have to imagine between the dedication to Chad Walsh, to the copyright in Joy's name, that he just felt that he owed her so much for his knowledge of the loves. I mean, he's, of course he can, he had an experience with some of them beforehand, but I would have to imagine to the fullness that he did by the end of his life came from her, from her opening him up, from her allowing him to blossom in all of those different areas. Uh, I have to imagine only David can answer this and you can answer this, but when you're in marriage, you obviously you experience arrows to a level that you can't outside of marriage. But even affection, even agape, it puts you in positions of greater amounts of both the gift love and the need love that we will be talking about here. So I have to imagine, at a minimum, he's just so incredibly grateful for the role that she's played in his life for him to be able to write this book. No, absolutely. And um, you, you have to think of them at each other's elbow. Um, yeah. And Joy herself talks about when they wrote Till We Have Faces, Lewis would write a chapter and then read it to her, and she would interject and... Um, and give comments, and then Lewis would go and rewrite the chapter. Um, so I would give anything uh, to to see a copy of that manuscript. Um, oh. At that time, in the mid to late 50s, um, Joy was writing her book about a French figure. Warney was writing one of his books of French history. Lewis was churning out um, what eventually became The Four Loves. He was doing reflections on the Psalms. Uh, I think Letters to Malcolm might have been in the works. And so uh, at one point, Joy calls it um, a veritable um, book factory, uh, Lewis and Lewis and Lewis and company. And remember the remember the timeline. Um, so Lewis and Joy um, first begin corresponding late in the 40s. They first meet in person in the fall of 1952. 1953, she moves to England, to London. Um, in 1955, she's still living in London, but that's when they write Till We Have Faces together. In 1957, they marry. Um, and so they have three years of happy marriage. And so this book is being written before the cancer returns, before their trip to Greece where the cancer returns. And so this is at the kind of golden season. And Lewis said uh, to Neville Coghill, I was surprised in my 60s to discover the happiness that had passed me by in my 20s. Um, and so this is an incredibly happy period in Lewis's life. The boys, David and Douglas, are usually away at school that Lewis paid for. And so there was a great deal of time together as man and wife and writing writing books. And so 1960 is the year that Joy dies. And that's also the year that till we have or that Four Loves comes out. Uh, remember, of course, Lewis dies late in 1963. So this is kind of the golden years of Lewis and Joy Davidman being married and this enormous productivity and Lewis's most mature works. Hmm. Andrew, would you mind saying a few words about the epigraph at the beginning of the book? 
So the book begins with a strange epigraph um, by John Donne, the poet who says, No man is an island and batter my heart, three person God, uh, a favorite of Lewis's. Lewis has, has written essays about him. And the epigraph is that our affections kill us not nor die. And one of the main points of the four loves is to position each of the loves correctly. So there's a, a wonderful question of proportion and value of each of the loves. And that's one of the great things that's going on here. And so that's why he pulls this quote from the litany, a prayer of supplication. So for those of you keeping um, track at home, it's stanza 27, line eight, that our affections kill us not nor die. Another quote that we'll hear come up a great deal is from Denis de Rougemont, the French author who says love ceases to be a demon when it ceases to be a god, which could in some ways be a summary. I also want to add one more quick word about the dedication. Uh, as I mentioned, it was Chad Walsh. Um, he wrote one of the first criticisms of Lewis, C.S. Lewis' apostle to the skeptics while Lewis was still alive. I have done some research at the Wade Center and read some oral history uh, interviews um, Lewis marries Joy in 1956 to extend his citizenship, and then again in 1957 to marry her for real. But in 1955, uh, Chad and Eva Walsh spent the summer in England and uh, make comments to the effect of everybody could see where this was going. So Chad and Eva and Warney could see that Jack was falling in love with Joy probably before Lewis was even willing to admit it to himself. And so that's the role of Chad Walsh, who became a very important friend and, um, and commentator on Lewis. So also last thing that I want to mention in terms of background, although we have the four loves mentioned here in 1960 near the end of Lewis's life, the idea about the four loves it permeates Lewis's writing. And the very first time you hear mention of all four loves all together in, in one letter is uh, the 4th of May, 1940 in a letter to Warney, um, where he talks about the three different Greek words for love. Um, eros, storge, and philia, and then agape. And so, and then you can find each of those four loves kind of extending back. So think about love as being something that Lewis is thinking about throughout his life. And indeed, if my, if my field theory of Lewis, that he is about clarity and charity, that it, Lewis is all about love is true. Uh, this is, I think, one of the, uh, one of the, the evidences of that. Well, thank you for that. And listeners, normally uh, in the week's well, we won't have an introduction like that. That was special to this episode. And normally, we'll have a very brief recap at this point in time, talking about last week to then segue into this week's episode. Now, since this is our first one, we replaced the recap with Andrew's introduction. So there will be no recap, but that will be coming next week. And so without further ado, we are going to push to the chapter summary. Yeah, so this is my 100-word summary of what we're going to be reading today, which is the first part of chapter one of The Four Loves. Lewis begins by saying that he originally thought that love only deserved to be called love insofar as it resembled that love which is God. Therefore, he divided love into need love and gift love, comparing these loves with the way that we love and the way that God loves. However, Jack ultimately rejects the idea that need love is mere selfishness, arguing that need love is still actually love. He defends this on the basis of linguistics, as well as by pointing out that our human nature is inherently needful. We need each other, and we are also utterly dependent upon God. Okay, so let's discuss today's text. As I alluded in my summary, Lewis originally thought that the subject of love was pretty simple. He says that when he first began writing The Four Loves, he thought the maxim from 1 John 4.16, the one that says, God is love, he's thought that it provided what he called a very plain high road through the whole subject of love. And he confesses that he originally thought that human loves deserve to be called loves at all, just as insofar as they resembled that love which is God. And because of this assumption, he says that he set about dividing love into two. So there were two loves, distinguishing between gift love and need love. So let me just kick this back to my co-hosts. How would you two describe these two categories of love? Well, I'll, I'll take the gift love. Uh, it feels like it's somewhat self-explanatory of this idea of a giving of yourself to the other on the surface. And if you think of Christ in the cross, kenosis, like that self-emptying type of love is what comes to my mind. 
the pouring out for the other, the loving the other for just the sake of the other. Uh, those are some statements and expressions that come to mind. Yeah. And for me, one of the real helpful ideas about gift love, um, a love that needs to needs to give, not only does that kind of jibe with my nature, and I think the nature of so many of us, we would much rather give than or be asked uh, to give than we would uh, be willing to receive. Um, well, Lewis talks about gift love in the like a nursing mother. If she doesn't give out what she has to give physically to her child, it's going to cause great discomfort and pain. And so there's this kind of sense of, especially with humans, um, uh, need love. Um, there's a marvelous quote by Frederick Beekner in his fantastic novel, Godric, which I recommend very highly. Um, it's written almost entirely in blank verse in iambic pentameter, if you can do that for the length of a novel. And Beekner says um, of a friend of his, his character says of a friend, uh, we loved each other for how we filled each other's need. God's loves all gift for he has need of naught. And I think that that kind of really summarizes it. Um, we come to each other humanly uh, for need. The, the Holy Trinity exists in no need of anything and is just the overflowing and the giving out. And so that's part of the distinction that's happening here. Yeah. So in the book, Lewis says that gift love is when somebody, say, works hard and sacrifices for their family and their family's future, which they themselves aren't even going to see. And he describes need love as, he says, it's whatever it is that drives a scared child into her mother's arms. Mm -hmm. And that description really hit home because I have now a small child who cries out for mm -hmm. me, <laughs> often very loudly and often in the middle of the night. Uh, but under this taxonomy, dividing love into gift love and need love, it, it's kind of as Andrew said, uh, Jack says that divine love is obviously gift love. Uh, this is the love and life of the Blessed Trinity. Whereas need love is very unlike God, since God lacks nothing. He needs nothing. And Paul bolsters his argument like St. Paul on Mars Hill by quoting pagan sources. He quotes Plato uh, from the Symposium. It's where we're told that we're born helpless and in need of others. And Lewis himself wraps up that section by saying, as soon as we are fully conscious, we discover loneliness. We need others physically, emotionally, intellectually. We need them if we are to know anything, even ourselves. And this is the first part of the text that we're going to look at today. And so what do you guys make of this distinction that Lewis makes between those loves? Does that, does that jibe with you? How did you feel when you first read it? Can I be honest here? No. Lie to me. Great. Right. <laughs> we don't like honesty and authenticity. No, Andrew, we, 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 so we want you to be honest. I've got to tell you, uh, this book really, even though it's the most important book I've read as an adult, I really had to slog through the first couple of chapters. Um, and in fact, it really was, this is one of those books that kind of taught me how to think and how to read. And I don't do philosophy all that well. And Lewis is, I think, speaking philosophically here. And so if you have rough going in chapter one and chapter two, um, you're in, it, well, you're at least in my company. I don't know if it's good company. Um, but <laughs> Lewis is very carefully making careful distinctions here. So I would encourage you as you read this chapter and, and wrestle with those distinctions, do the same thing that I recommend um, that you do with, with mere Christianity. Read it out loud read it to someone else and stop as soon as you lose the plot. You know, as soon as you start losing kind of what Lewis's argument is, um, I would stop there. So the distinction between need love and gift love, I think kind of makes perfect sense. And Lewis himself uh, begins by admitting that he thought it was going to be easier than that. And it was a whole lot more complicated. <laughs> and then he makes the first two chapters rather complicated too. But I think that if you will train yourself up to read what he's actually saying, um, to me anyway, I think that, that that distinction is helpful. What about you, Matt? I have two thoughts. I'll, this first section, I do appreciate, and I, listeners, you're already probably seeing this, that there's going to be a lot of nuances to this. And off the bat, I, as much as that's going to be somewhat make the reading a little bit more difficult, I'm, I'm glad because our, our world has massively diluted like the statement, God is love, and then to just stop there. And you're just supposed to know what that means. 
I'm like, well, what is love? What does that mean of how he loves me? What does that mean of how I'm supposed to love him? How am I supposed to love creation creatures? What does that look like? I mean, I think it's just so much way too much thrown around today. So I'll start with that, that I get excited that this book is about to unpack this so we can have a better sense of what that means. Now, in terms of the gift, love, need, love, I have a bit of a working hypothesis similar to Till We Have Faces. I have read The Four Loves. It was probably eight years ago. I want to say I just graduated college, and this is my first time back through it. I'm starting to wonder. I, I, I appreciate the distinction, and I might completely change this in two or three chapters as we go through this, but... The purest form of need love, you know, he talks about the deluded sense of need love, of of just a complete desperate neediness. And that's not really even a need love, that's a selfishness. But the purest form of it, of a child needing a mother, but I think you can use a bit of a more of an adult that is coming to a friend in need is kind of a gift love, I actually think. Because it's just giving of your vulnerability, giving of it's it is almost it's a different type of giving in my opinion. I'm not quite sure I would call it a neediness. I think it's I think back to Diana Glyer when she gave the example of Tolkien and Lewis. And Tolkien asked him to read that poem. You could say there was almost a need there, but I would say it was a gift of himself. You know, when you depend on a person, you are giving of yourself. That's really beautiful to be the other person receiving it. And it's a trust. And you could another person could be giving constantly in terms of service and sacrifice, but because they never do the need love, I'm not really sure they're giving a ton because the giving of the self to me is the most important type of giving. And again, this is the form that's not the needy, desperate, clingy person that just has to go pour everything on everyone because they're looking for validation. It's, it's the pure sense of what I think Lewis is talking about. So I'm, I might have a bit of a working hypothesis that I think that they all wrap under gift <laughs> love, but we'll see. I could comment on both of what you've said, but I think that you're both underscoring the point, like Lewis, that the, the original thought looked quite neat and clean and easy. But after you start unpacking a little bit, you find out that it's much more complicated than you expected. And I haven't really spoken autobiographically about my relationship to this book, but this was one of the first ones where I really grew to love Lewis. And the more positive spin of what I put on what Andrew said is that this book gets better and better as you keep mm -hmm. going. Uh, but it's also one that as I have returned to it, my opinions about what it's saying and its ideas have shifted. How so? Oh, that would be telling. <laughs> we will, we'll, we'll have to wait until we get to the later chapters. But I, I, I'm starting to, I think I just got so excited with the writing and some of the ideas and the frameworks that he gave. I start, I accepted them too, a little bit too blankly, mm -hmm. a little bit too mm -hmm. easily. And now there are more of them that I kind of want to challenge mm -hmm. or at least rethink what he might be saying. But let's let's push on because I think more of this will come out in the wash. Before we do, I just want to bring up an incredible point that is in the next chapter, actually. But it's one of the hallmark points that I that I taught my students, and I think that it's really helpful here. He says the human mind is generally far more eager to praise and dispraise than to describe and define. And so I think that part of the struggle in this book and part of the struggle with Lewis in his prose is to define and describe what we mean. So I would probably take the opposite tack of, of Matt, and I would say that all humans are only capable of need love, that even the need to give is itself a need. And I would point to the Spanish, querer, querer, to want, right? Um, as, as this kind of uh, this sense of need love. But I think that there's great war to be had here. Oh, I agree. You I'm think the great divorce till we have faces war? No, no. This 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 season we're gonna have far better <laughs> arguments about love. Well, and we look forward to hearing feedback from our listeners about what they think uh, about need love and gift love. In any case, just to even make the distinction is not something I would have thought of doing. And this is part of why Lewis too uh, helped me to think this this was another one of the this was one of those books like David, where things kind of came wide open when I really understood what Lewis was doing here. So Lewis goes on to say that he was looking forward to some, as he calls it, fairly easy panegyrics, which means words of praise. He thought that he was just going to write about how great gift love is and then just disparage need love. But he concluded that although much of what he thought about love still remains to be true, he just can't make such a simple assessment anymore. And he does concede that if all that we mean by love is a craving to be loved, then we're in a really bad situation. But along with his hero, George MacDonald, he rejects the idea that this craving, that in this craving, we are mistaking for love something that is not love at all. Lewis affirms he believes 
that need love actually is love. And he says that when you try and deny this, you end up in all kinds of problems. And we're going to look at that in a moment. But before we get to that, what do you guys think on this? Do, do you agree? Matt, you seem to have a different way of, of looking at what need love actually is. Do you think it's love? I do because of what I was, I mean, if my first of all, I mean, reiterate this is a working hypothesis off of two chap <laughs> paragraphs right now <laughs> it actually just came to me like in the last i always read it many times but then i'll read it right before we do the recording and i was like oh it's a new thought it's percolating so we'll see but if my thought is correct yeah i would i would think it almost upgrades the level of love that it would be although technically i would almost argue that it's not even there but um because it's all part of gift love but but you seem to talk about that there's, that there's sort of a bad kind of need love and a good kind of need love or was I misunderstanding you? Yes. Oh, well, that, yes. But that's more Lewis's point. But yes, I agree with him on that sense. I think there's definitely, although I wouldn't even call it a need love then. I would just call it a neediness. Um, I don't know if I would use the word need love. Well, and remember that screw tape's always trying to twist things, right? So need love is good because, you know, I mean, you go back to the scriptures, we love because he first loved us, right? And our love always has to be dependent on God. He is, what does mere Christianity say? He is the, 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 the fuel on which our machine, our human machine runs, right? So anything that we have, especially something as high and central as love, has got to be from God, even if all we have of it is need. Even that, I think, is a gift. And so um, there's that marvelous English proverb, for want of a nail, the shoe was lost, for want of a shoe, the the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. For want of the rider, the battle was lost. For want of the battle, the war was lost. And want is that great English word which means to lack. But I think that one of the best places that we can that we can get spiritually is to recognize that you know his power is made perfect in our weakness. That all we are in some ways is want. That we lean wholly on God. And that all of our need at the root of it is need love because we have need of him. Like Beekner said, we love fulfilling each other's need, but God's love is all gift for he has need of naught. And so I think that that's a great place to start, to realize our full dependence on God, that we can't bring him anything and that we need his love. Um, and I think that he speaks that language because he pours out. He always gives out. Yeah, I think what you just said, Andrew, is really beautifully said, the the... The metaphor of our need for God or a child's need for a mother are going to be two really helpful metaphors, not even metaphors, but just helpful imagery as we think through unpacking these. Well, and then Lewis, uh, he points out three problems that arise if you're trying to deny that need love is actually love. And he first of all points to language. He says that despite some difficulties, language contains a good deal of stored insight and experience. And I'm sure that Tolkien, the philologist, would have loved this argument, along with Owen Barfield and his love for ancient semantic unities. But what do you guys think he means by this? He, he, he doesn't really unpack what he means. Uh, is it just the fact that because we call it need love, that we should at least by default accept it as a love? I'm not sure, but I think that he, he what Lewis is doing is reviewing the history of literature and saying need love is always described as love. And we do it some disservice. He says that earlier. We do it disservice to try and call it anything else. Um, it's perhaps not the best word. And of course, love is a much more nuanced word in many other languages um, than it is in English. I mean, I can love an ice cream cone and I can love God. And that seems a little uh, disjointed to me. Um, but I think that you have to, at, at, at least at the outset, acknowledge that you must call it at least love. Um, and that's at least a place to start. Was he? Did he create this term, or is he getting it from somewhere else? Need love? Is he? Yeah, is this a Lewis created term? I doubt it, um, but I think that it's the first. He's one of the first ones to really kind of uh, talk about it and systematize, yeah, systematize it. it. Sure, and that's a I think a great quote for our dear friend Jason Lepoyarvi, and so I look forward to having Doctor Love back on the program to ask him about the hard stuff here. Oh yes, I have questions for him. <laughs> uh, in particular, the, the next bit that Lewis says, which I think is slightly unclear, I thought of Dr. Stephen Beebe when he said Lewis actually isn't always brilliantly clear in things that he says. He says that if we disregard language, it will later get its revenge. And he talks about Humpty Dumpty, that uh, 
he we shouldn't be like him trying to make words mean whatever we wanted uh what do you make of that what does he mean language will get its revenge and what did humpty dumpty have to do with it well could this be related to or another way to think about this is when he uses in mere christianity the loss of the word gentleman and how when we start losing that term it just the revenge is almost it hurts society it's a really vague way of putting it. But if you have a society that can't define things very well, that becomes very hard for people to understand how what people mean, how they're supposed to live. If they're reading a book that talks about a certain way to live, or even if they're reading uh, scripture, it's like words matter for us to understand how to do things. And if we just start belittling, diluting, conv- convoluting, convoluting, confiscating, convoluting, <laughs> obfuscating, confiscating. There's a word. Confiscating. <laughs> not confis- We have our not first uh, uh, Bushian uh, <laughs> uh, neologism of the of the season. <laughs> uh, it's it's. There, we're going to call them madisms, and this will not be the first one. I ca- I'm confiscating words from the English dictionary. One at a time, holding them to ransom. Oh, uh, you didn't! You didn't. <laughs> well done. Um, I want to uh, to refer to a poem that that I uh, I mentioned. I think on the podcast with Shane, not an often quoted um, poem by Lewis. It's called Readjustment, and he writes it towards the end of his life. Um, it may be even one of his most pessimistic poems, and he talks about the new the new apes, the new hominidae, hominidae. And he says, between the new hominidae, and these are the, the ape, a- apes, um, it, between the new hominidae and, th- and us who are dying, already there rises a barrier across which no voice can ever carry, for devils are unmaking language. And one of the things that's happening in Lewis's period, I mean, Frederick Saussure um, was a, a linguist, and he talked about the distance between the signified and the signifier. Now, I don't want to get too deeply into semantics because I'm out of my depth to begin with, but Saussure talked about how every language has a different word for a table, table or mesa or whatever, maison. Um so we have different words for the actual thing itself. And so there's some distance between what we use for a word and the actual thing. Language is beginning to really slip. And that happens in the kind of deconstruction that begins at the end of World War II. Um, I think Eliot is part of this too. And so Lewis, part of what Lewis is saying is we distrust language, um, but but I, one of the jobs, I think, of the Inklings is to reinvest our belief in language. I think part of Tolkien's project in inventing 14 languages in The Lord of the Rings is to say that you can trust language because one of the natural results of saying that language is untrustworthy is you begin to feel like the logos, Christ himself, is untrustworthy. And the 20th century is kind of full of this. And if we disregard language, you hear echoes of abolition of man and his discussion of sublime. If we discard, uh, disregard it, it will later get its revenge. So um, we have to trust language because language is all that we have. Um, so that's part of it. What's that Humpty Dumpty quote that he's referring to, though? I actually did look this up. This is from a different Lewis, Lewis Carroll. <laughs> uh, so Humpty Dumpty was a nursery rhyme that appeared in England, I think, around the 18th century. Uh, but it was also used in a book by Lewis Carroll, where Humpty Dumpty speaks to Alice. This is Alice from Wonderland, yep. who threw the looking glass. And he says, uh, when I use that word, it means what I mean it to mean. Basically, he's using language and words in how, in a way that he wants to use it. And people just need to know that. But I think you're spot on. I think spot on with the abolition of man and the meaning of the word sublime. What does it mean? Does it mean that the object, the waterfall in this case, is sublime? Or am I talking about my own feelings? And the other thing that your response put me in mind of was the Screwtape letters. Screwtape is repeatedly talking about language. He talks about their philology department, that they are doing excellent work. So I think he's basically saying, as as you said, we need to trust language. There's another piece of it in mere Christianity, not to hit all of those marvelous highlights from our first few seasons. But in mere Christianity, he says, essentially, if there is no, if the universe is meaningless, that one of the things in the universe that would be meaningless is the idea of meaning and the idea of meaninglessness. So if the universe is meaningless, 
meaninglessness is itself meaningless. So once you start pulling on that thread and you don't trust language, what can you use to express yourself, you know, accept language to talk about the untrustworthiness of language? And if language is untrustworthy, then can you trust the word untrustworthy? And so I think that Lewis and Tolkien are really kind of actively leading this charge back into uh, uh, back into the importance of language. By the way, just quickly, there's a connection between Lewis and Lewis Carroll, because not only was Lewis Carroll an Oxford mathematician, but Lewis Carroll, um, Matthew Dogsden, used to go read his children's stories to Lewis's master, George MacDonald. And if McDonald's <laughs> children liked the Lewis Carroll stories, the Alice stories, he knew that he was onto something. So there's a, what is a Lewis Carroll is a tertiary Lewisian relic, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's look at the next section because Jack goes on to give the second reason why it's problematic to deny that need love is really love and to characterize it as mere selfishness. Even though Jack actually uses the word mere in his title, Mere Christianity, he says that mere is a dangerous word. He agrees that any impulse can be selfishly indulged, and he admits that uh, a tyrannous and gluttonous demand for affection is a horrible thing. Uh, but he gives two counterexamples of need love, and we mentioned one of them today, the, the child seeking its mother's comfort, and the other one is an adult uh, seeking the company of his friends. And Lewis says that nobody would call these impulses mere selfishness. Would you both agree? I, I'm pretty convinced. Absolutely. Yeah. By the way, mere, think of mere not as not the word just, but the word pure, comes from the Latin merum. And this was the wine that was so potent that you mixed merum with one part of merum with 20 parts water. That's how, that's how high proof wow. uh, merum was. And if you, uh, if you did any Latin and you read your Horace, Horace used to love to drink straight merum. Uh, at his farm. So that's like a country boy hanging out, drinking Everclear on the farm. Um, but mere means pure. And um, need love is really love and characterize it as pure selfishness. But um, is anything that humans can do pure? And did Christ himself have need love? Did he need the Blessed Virgin? He absolutely did. So if our Lord had need and need love uh, for his mother, I think that we're safe to have uh, need love as well. When you're speaking about it being baked into the human condition, and that's really pretty much what Jack says. He says that although we might even need to deny ourselves need love from time to time, if somebody never felt need love... That that's not good. Yeah, you know, God in Genesis said it is not good for man to be alone, and Lewis says that uh, it's a bad spiritual symptom. In the same way that if somebody has a complete lack of appetite, that's a bad medical symptom because we need food. Well, likewise, we need to need things, and he even goes so far as to say that if somebody has no need of others, that's the mark of a cold egoist. Well, I want to also mark that uh, we're 30 minutes into the new season and the Episcopalian is the first one to bring up the uh, the Blessed Virgin. So um, you need to give me marks for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm curious, you guys, this thoughts. I have this, it's, it's that continuing thought that I have percolating in my head from the beginning, but gift love, this giving of yourself to someone, right? And now you have need love we've been talking about. Like under gift love, if someone's just constantly serving the other, but they're never allowing someone to, ser to serve them, are they really loving? I'm trying to just see if you can have these mutually exclusive. I mean, I guess the answer is yes, because God does that. So, But from a human perspective, I'm just picturing a person who really never allows themselves to truly be vulnerable, but they're willing to serve someone else. And not in like the the example of like the mother that's doing it in a way that she's manipulating. It's still pure and it's really pouring into the other and giving to them, but you never allow someone to you, maybe from wounds or trauma from childhood. Are you, it just feels still wrong to me. Well, and let me throw this, let me throw this out. And uh, it's a sincere question. Is our gift love ever free from need love? Do we as humans ever give without at least some kind of selfish motive? 
I mean, yes, let's read every time somebody gets married, love is patient, love is kind, blah, blah, blah. And let's aspire to that in all of our loves, to be unconditional and loving and pure. But I don't know about you. You guys are probably much better than me. But I find it hard to to even do my best giving without at least a little bit of a feeling of what what's in it for me. And that's just because I'm such a terrible person. And that's why I'm in seminary. <laughs> I need as much theology as I can get. Well, Andrew, maybe that's what I'm getting at. Can I like a phrase that can you have gift love without need love? And can you have need love without gift love? And that's also maybe what my working hypothesis is, is are these distinctions, while I think very helpful and true, are they still imperfect? Because I'm struggling to see them as perfect distinctions. I understand what Lewis is trying to communicate with this, and I think it's valuable for the sake of this conversation. Do I accept it at face value? I'm not sure yet. Let me say that I think the the distinctions are are perfect and the distinctions are good. I think that our mix of them is never pure. Um, so I think that Lewis's distinctions are good or as good as we're going to get. But our experience of need, love, and gift love is hopelessly mixed or mixed up. Um, I don't know, David, what do you think? I was just going to say that I think it largely depends on something that the first time I read this book, I didn't notice it. Lewis never actually defines what love is. Hmm. He says that in love, in this case, there's need love and there's gift love. He talks about need, he talks about gift, but not love itself. And I think a lot of how we choose to answer the questions that Matt just raised depends on how we actually go ahead and define mm -hmm. love. Because we kind of have to do it ourselves in this because Lewis doesn't do it for us. And I guess I would argue maybe my view of it is love is like, a giving of the self, but take away giving because that's about to confuse us with gift loving. Like, don't, <laughs> don't, don't, um, don't bring, don't, don't correlate those yet. Like a giving of self can be physically, it can be spiritually, it can be emotionally, it can be mentally. So with the physically, that can be of your time, it can be of your treasure, like giving of yourself. And so when, if you're not giving, so that's where I think need love can still be a gift love because it's it's just a giving of yourself to some degree because you're you're almost giving of a vulnerability to another person. I've said this before, but let me read you what Lewis said in the transcript of the Four Loves Talks from 1958. He's going on about um, Storgi and uh, affection. He says, uh, being the oldest most spontaneous form in which we go out of ourselves towards others is what he call is what he's as he's describing Storgi. And I think that that's as close as Lewis gets, and perhaps maybe for me anyway, as close as we need to a definition of love. Love is to go out of ourself and towards others. And I've talked about that here before, and it's what makes or Orwell so trapped. She can't get out of herself, and she can't go towards anybody else, and she accuses Ungut of being this kind of seething, hopeless need, um, but actually it's the, the need is within her. So I'm going to suggest the Lewisian definition of love is going out of ourself towards another. And I'm going to leave that, <laughs> and we will come back to that. In subsequent episodes, because I, I think we, we, we might test that okay, a little good. bit and see whether or not we want to tweak good. it. But let's get on to the third problem for those who deny that need love is actually love. And Lewis says that this one is the most important. And he begins by pointing out something which every Christian should basically agree with, that namely that a man's spiritual health is an exact proportion to his love of God. So if I love God very little, I'm in a poor spiritual state. If I love him a lot, then I'm in great shape. And then he broadens out the point from the previous section. There he said that humans need each other. And in this section, he says, not only do we need each other, but we need God. You know, we pray for help during trials. We pray for forgiveness when we sin. And so when it comes to God, we're inherently needful. And this means that man's love for God must be mostly, almost entirely need love. And this reminded me as I was preparing the notes, it reminded me of something I saw on Facebook recently that said, Jesus didn't say, come to me, all you who are crushing it, living your best life, and I will give you rest. He said, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Mm -hmm. If you're discouraged, tired, or weary, don't worry. That's exactly how Jesus expected you to come home. Mm. You know, it, it jibes so well with 1 Corinthians 1.6, where he says, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. And it means that he has not brought it to completion, 
because we haven't reached the day of Christ, and that it is he who will bring that good work to completion. And so for me, fundamentally, it means if I'm screwing up, I'm doing it right. I'm supposed to be screwing up. I think that that mitigates against the kind of perfectionism that we're sometimes in some Christian circles driven towards. Um, And remember that we are dead in trespasses and sins, that God's mercy comes near to us when we are absolutely helpless. And our conversion comes the moment that we acknowledge that we are so helpless. It's part of why AA is so successful in what it does, because the the, the 12 steps are based on the scripture that we realized that we had uh, that we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable to to admit our powerlessness this is the first step of aa but that's also the first step of a healthy spiritual life to realize that it must all come from him all of the doing must be done by him and that's what orwall realizes at the end that she has no doing. Her whole life's work is is useless. All the doing must be done by love. Unless love comes down and reaches us, we can't uh, we can't get anywhere to begin with. Is there even a form of a bad need love with God? And we're talking about a bad need love with another human. And so we can all picture the desperate, clingy person that's just, it's gone too far. And it's honestly out of some sort of validation or something. But with God... Can you ever go too far one way? Like it's almost like more needy, more desperate, um, almost more clingy to God is a beautiful thing. And so I'm, I'm guessing I'm just trying to, as I beg the question of, is there bad warped forms when you're in relation to humans just because of humanity and that's different than God and there's not in terms of with God? Hmm. Now let me go back to the definition and say, it's when we go out of ourselves towards others. So if need love focuses me on myself, like with screw tape and wormwood, right? If I want others as cattle to feed me, right? If I turn to others for my own selfishness, and we all know those vampire type people who will tend to suck us dry. You know, I think that there can be bad need love when it's, when it's focused in. Uh, when it focuses me on my helplessness, that's when I cry out to God. And so I think you judge a tree by its fruits. I don't know. What do you think, David? I think it's much harder for that kind of love to go wrong with regards to God. I think that actually in the very act of turning to God, going out of mm-hmm. yourself, uh, the impurities will become purified. Need love becomes so destructive with other people because they typically don't have the wisdom, resources, power uh, that uh, that is really necessary to fulfill all of my needs. But by definition, God does, God is. So I think we can we can come to God with our brokenness, uh, but as long as we're coming with our brokenness, uh, we can be as needy as we want because he will uh, even fix our needs. As long as we come to him uh, as we truly are, not, shall we say, wearing a mask or a veil. <laughs> Well, Ooh, and let's remember the, the scripture zingers. that our God will supply all our needs according to his riches in glory, right? The need is something that we'll always be saddled with. The The key crux and the big takeaway that I would encourage folks, and here I'm preaching, meddling, I don't know, priesting, whatever you want to call it. The holiest word that we can say in this whole world is thou to God. You, you God is always the... Uh, is is the holiest thing not me it's no nobis right not not to us o lord but to thy name give glory not me but you and our need forces me to go there's not anything in me it's um uh it's the apologist evening prayer lo the wells are and then seeing me empty you forsake the you know I, I seek in myself the things i mean to say and lo the wells are dry then seeing me empty, you forsake the listener's role and through my dead lips and into utterance wakes the thoughts I never knew. I seek in myself what I need to say, and I don't even have the words to confess my own need. And when and God, Lewis says in that poem, sees us empty and then fills even our word. So I think that our need love cry out to God is itself a gift from God. So next up, Lewis does a bit of a pivot because he's just described humanity. He says there's one vast need, incomplete, preparatory, empty yet cluttered, crying out for him who can untie things that are now knotted together and tie up the things that are still dangling loose. 
So it's one big, huge bundle of needs. But Lewis does suggest that we can actually bring to God something other than our need love. And as evidence, he points to what he calls exalted souls, which I would take to mean great saints, either here on earth or in heaven. Uh, So these people who have achieved great holiness, uh, who encourage us to push further up and further in, so to speak, uh, with regards to our loves. But Lewis says that they would warn us against thinking that we could get completely away from need love. He says it'd be pretty dumb uh, for a creature to come before its creator and say that they have no need and they just love their creator disinterestedly. He says if we tried to do this, uh, that it would cease to be true graces, would become neoplatonic or finally diabolical illusions. This is another thing. I wasn't quite sure what Lewis was getting at. I get the general gist that we can't come to God and think that we can uh, never be in need before him. Do you guys have anything to illuminate that? Well, this idea that we could just love him disinterestedly, that we don't have anything you know, that we need from him, I think is absolutely a diabolical illusion. I don't know my philosophy well enough to know uh, to, to pick up the Neoplatonic reference. If we did this, they would cease to be true graces. And remember that grace is this unmerited gift. It's this gift that you don't deserve. Uh, The thumbnail sketch that I've tossed out here before of mercy and grace. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. And grace is getting what you do not deserve. And so I think that he's pointing to this, again, this sense that that even the good that we have, uh, we're running on somebody else's fuel. And to think that we weren't, I think, would be uh, would be diabolical. Hmm. Well, Lewis actually quotes one of these exalted <laughs> souls, Thomas Akempis, from his book, The Imitation of Christ. And I've started reading Lewis's letters, and he keeps recommending this book. And I have read it once, and I did enjoy it. Uh, but Jack quotes the maxim, which we're going to hear on more than one occasion throughout this book. The highest does not stand without the lowest. What does he mean by that? I thought he meant the highest if in this sense of like giving a very pure form of gift love to God doesn't stand without the lowest of a very pure need love for God. Now the danger with that interpretation, but I actually think that's what it means, but the danger of it is it's making need love seem low and gift love seem high, which I I, I guess technically they would be, but his whole point is you don't want to try to rank them that way. Need love is actually a, a form of beautiful love as well. And so I'm not sure if that's a, a fair thing to do, but I think that's what he means here because they're going to, in a second after they feel like they've just given something to God, they're not going to beat their chest. They're going to be like, but I am like the worst and the most miserable of them all. And so they just did something really high and beautiful. And then immediately they're, they got the other side as well. Well, and I think that one of the joys of the great saints is that the closer that they get to Christ, the more they start writing about the dark night of the soul and how terrible (laughs) they are. And so the Mm -hmm. closer they are in their saintliness, the more unworthy they feel, because that's true. But then the more they are bowled over by the imputed worth of grace. And so the, the closer these great saints get, the more they see they're standing in need of grace and the more grace they can appropriate. This whole idea, too, I think that this would be quickly, quickly resolved if we had our dear friend Steve Beebe with us, because the highest does not stand without the lowest. It's what I call Lewis chucking us under the chin, right? The, that the view of things is exactly as we see it, and there's also so much more. And Steve Beebe, I think, would clearly point to this being the transpositional nature of God, right? That we take this high concept, and then he puts it into this very common language. And that's what happens in the kenosis, right? That's what happens in the incarnation. The highest does not stand without the lowest. Could Christ have said no to his commission to become man? Well, I don't even want to discuss or, 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 or break my brain thinking about it, but he is the highest and the lowest at the, at the same time. The cross and the resurrection operating as this same truth is part of what he means by some of this. And that's the way the universe works then. And there is this kind of paradox that we see keep shooting through Christianity. Sorry, I've been reading too much Cheston recently. I see it everywhere now. I'm sorry. Um, Wait, is there such a thing, please, as too much and Chesterton? Oh, we'll forgive you for saying that and let you start again. <laughs> mea culpa. But the pattern that you humble yourself and you are thereby exalted, 
It's in Mary's Magnificat. It's in the Carmen Christi of Philippians. That when we empty ourselves, we are then filled. Mm -hmm. And Lewis himself says that God likes it this way. He says, come unto me, all you who travail and are heavy laden. And in the Old Testament, open your mouth wide and I will fill mm -hmm. it. That God delights to give. And part of that is us coming to him in our brokenness mm -hmm. and in our emptiness. Mm -hmm. And in, in coming to him like that, we are changed from that immediately. He opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And that marvelous old chorus, you know, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up, right? It's that exchange that happens. And thank, thankfully, uh, our Lord himself was the great model for that, uh, our exemplar going before us. And so we come to the final part of today's text, where Jack draws some conclusions about need love. And his summation is this, that need love either coincides with, or at least makes our main ingredient in man's highest, healthiest, and most realistic spiritual condition. And he said some odd things follow from this, but we're going to pick that up next week when we finish the chapter. So do you guys have any closing thoughts on this? I know we've sort of looked at his text, pulled it apart, not sure if we agree with it or agree with it. Uh, and it's all very provisional and uncertain. And we possibly have more questions than answers. Uh, but do you have anything that you want to say as we, as we wrap up today's episode? I genuinely want to leave this. I don't want to... It's, I'm very much the type where I can extrapolate too quickly. And I, I shared some of those extrapolations during the episode, but they're all working thoughts at this stage. And so... I want to leave it with some more questions. we got part two coming next week that I hopefully we'll get a little bit more clarity. And then, of course, as we go through the book. So I'm happy to leave it with these questions. Me too. I would just throw in um, a word. Uh, I see from our notes in this section that I've already talked about most of the notes that I made for this section. But I would leave with a word from Letters to Malcolm written around the same time. Lewis says about praying silently, he says, beware the error of the Stoics to think that we can always do what we can sometimes do. And so even in thinking through Lewis at the best of our game, um, let's be aware and let's be gentle with ourselves to, 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 to realize that we might not be able to always understand everything that's going on. But if we get some glimmers, um, I think that those will unfold. And in fact, I know for sure that those ideas about need, love, and gift love, and just being able to grapple or to identify them, uh, th those will become really helpful tools for us as we read through the book. And speaking of being aware, I think that would be my closing invitation to our listeners. As you go through this coming week, be aware and think about the things that you uh, do and say and the things that are said and done to you and try and put them into this need, love, gift, love category. Do they fit neatly or do you see some problems with it already? I don't know. This is going to be a very interesting book as we try and understand the nature of love. <laughs> well, and I think my final word would be the word that I always start and with and have in the middle as well. Uh, and I would encourage listeners to check in and I encourage you gentlemen to check in with me when we record episode two. And I encourage my wife to hold me to this as well. Love one another. Forget about yourself. Do something out of, do nothing out of selfish ambition or con vain conceit, but in humility, count others better than yourselves. Clear somebody's plate, forgive somebody who doesn't deserve it. Give somebody something that they uh, weren't expecting. Love one another and love God. Spend time with him. Um, realize that he loves you. And that's the most important thing of all is the height and the breadth and the depth of the love of God who doesn't have any need but still chooses to, uh, to love you. And so I would say wrap yourselves up uh, in the love of God and in pouring that love out as best you can. And remember that we love as he first loved us and we, um, we love each other as we have been loved. And so uh, it's okay to care for yourself. Don't go out and do, 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 do um, uh, until you have made sure that you have filled up your tank and, uh, and, and cared for yourself, because that's, that's uh, I think, God's heart and attitude towards you. Well, I hear the last call bell ring here at the Eagle and Child. <gasps> oh, it's at the Lamb and Flag. St. John's College <laughs> is now sponsored, and the Lamb and Flag will remain open. Yay! <laughs> okay, we, 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 we will uh, virtually shift over to the Lamb and Flag in honor of this wonderful event. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, we've gone a little longer today, but we had to go through all of the background. So future episodes, we'll be keeping it under under an hour. That's, that's our goal at any rate. Uh, but we'd like to thank you all for listening and to all of our Patreon supporters, particularly our top tier supporters. That's Sterling, Shane, John, Kevin, Brian, Kay, Monique, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Stephen, Matt, Jeff, Kelly, Chris, John, James. Oh, I missed one. <laughs> Stephen, Matt, Jeff, Kelly, Chris, John, Kate, Peter and Rowdy. Listeners, please check us out on social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Shout out to Andrew Gilbertson, who sent me a message on YouTube just before we began recording. Please rate and review us wherever you listen to us. And be sure to check out our newly revamped website, pintswithjack.com, where you can find endless resources about Lewis and his works, and also pick up some sweet merchandise, including our new Pints with Jack coffee mugs. So, listeners, thank you for starting Season 5 with us, for being so faithful, or for jumping in for your first time. And please join us next time, when we'll be finishing up Chapter 1. When we'll be going further up. And further in. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.